All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank everyone for joining today's Bold Bible Study. Um, our topic is Casualties of War. It is already August 2022. The year is going by really, really fast, but the Lord placed it up on my heart to go ahead and proceed with this teaching given the season that we are about to enter next. And I will jump into that in a moment, but let me start out by introducing myself and telling you a little bit about myself if you are um, joining us for the first time. My name is Nina Anderson. I am the founder of Fade to Bold and the Fade to Bold uh, Bible study teacher and servant leader. My leaders, my pastors, my spiritual parents are Apostles Daniel and Natricia McClendon of Revolution Church in Lancaster, California. So before I get started, let me send a warm uh, shout out to my Revolution Church family. I love you guys. Thank you. I know we are spread out across all time zones. You all could be anywhere else, but you are spending uh, time with me this morning in the word of God, and it is appreciated. So shout out to my church family. Um, just to inform those who are not familiar with us um, about our beliefs here in Faith to Bold, we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in everything about Jesus Christ and who he is in our lives. We believe in uh, the power of the name of Jesus. We believe in the power of the blood of Jesus. We believe that he was born of the Virgin Mary, that he died for our sins, and he overcame the world on our behalf, um, and that he rose again. Again. Uh, we believe that he sits at the right hand of the Father today, making intercession. When he left, he left the Holy Spirit as a comfort and counselor to us, and we believe that he is the only way to God, our Father. He is the way, the truth, and the light, and that is what we believe here in the Faith to Bold community, and the mission is really simple. We want to galvanize people to walk with Christ in holy boldness and walk in their identity boldly as it relates to being on this journey with him, and if you're not familiar with the term galvanize, it really means to charge people up, to get them excited about an issue or a matter or about doing something, so we we want people to be excited and charged up about Christ, about the cause for Christ, about uh, the good news and sharing the gospel with other believers. So that is our mission. Just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, please remain on mute unless invited um, to come off of mute. You can leverage the Zoom reaction buttons um, for uh, interaction. As a matter of fact, I like the interaction. It keeps us all engaged. If you have questions, you can post them in the chat. And as soon as I see them, we can we can we can talk about them and unpack them. Um, you can send a message to any of the co-facilitators or to myself if you need any support during the session. That being said, we're going to go ahead and dive into our topic, which is casualties of war. And um, the alternate title, if I had to give it one, would be avoiding spiritual ambush. Um, this is a matter of life and death for believers in Christ in terms of spiritual warfare, what we do and how we conduct ourselves in the midst of warfare. This is a matter of reinforcement as it relates to those who are soldiers in the army of the Lord. I know y'all remember that song from back in the day. I can't sing, so I'm not going to bust out and sing it for you, but y'all know the one your granny church used to sing, they soldiers in the army of the Lord. So there are rules for engagement as it relates to us being soldiers in the army of the Lord. So the Holy Spirit impressed this message upon me to share because we are approaching a season or a time in the year when the antics and the plots and ploys and scheme of the enemy begin to elevate, they begin to intensify. As we get closer to the month of October, the warfare and the persecution against the saints increases, but the Lord would not have us enter a season and have us be unaware of the wiles and schemes of the enemy. He would not have us enter a season like that, inequipped. So the kingdom of darkness 
they start plotting and planning and, and scheming. They do this all day. They do it all the time. They take no breaks. We have an opportunity right now to make sure we are prepared for engagement because this is not going to be a time for retreat. It's not going to be a time for us to run away from the conflict that we face. We have to be cautious, though, to not be spiritually ambushed. There are many intercessors who end up in spiritual ICUs because they believe that they can go at this alone. This is not a time for the long ranger to prove themselves about how much they know in the spirit and, and prove that they're strong enough to take, take the heat. This is not the time for the solo vigilante, vigilante to be hyped up. And I'm going to share why in just a couple of slides, but we are many members of one Body. Every member has a function. We can't continue to keep losing our members, those who are hands and feet of God in the earth, those who operate as hearts, as brains, as eyes, as lungs. Every part of the physical body has a function. Every part of the body of Christ has a function. And this is not a time for our members to lose the ability to function in their role. This is not a time for um, our members to be in the, the infirmaries, in the hospital wards. It's, it's not time for that. But there is a wisdom and there are practical steps that we can apply during spiritual warfare to avoid becoming a casualty of war. Before I go any further, I do want to cover this time in prayer. So if you guys can bow your heads with me and I'm going to pray and I've been praying since the Lord gave me the message, but I want to pray with us and just consecrate this time unto him. So dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to come before you on today. We enter your courts with thanksgiving and your gates with praise. We declare that you are King of Kings and that you are Lord of Lords in our lives. We say that Holy Spirit, you are the most influential person in our lives. There's no one more important to us than you. We want to hear what you have to say about a matter. We want your wise counsel. We want your wisdom. We ask that you grant understanding and additional knowledge where necessary as we prepare to encounter conflict on the battlefield during a war or for a war that wages on in the backdrop of our lives, oh Lord. So Father, as this word goes forth, I just decrease that you may increase and have your way. I declare that every Seed planted is being planted into soft um, and flesh hearts in the name of Jesus. And if an existing seed is being watered, Lord, I ask that you give the increase for your glory. It is in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, that we pray on today. Amen. 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 All right, let's get into it. Oh, I already prayed. Next slide. <laughs> So what is a casualty? I'm really big on breaking down words to make sure that we are using them in the proper context. So what is a casualty? In Merriam-Webster's dictionary, a casualty, and we have a couple of, of definitions up there, but a casualty is a military person lost through death, wounds, injury, sickness, internment, or capture, or through being missing in action. I'm going to pause right there and just brief commentary. How many of us just go MIA when the going gets tough? We disappear. We don't want any parts of it. We, we especially don't want people to see what's happening. We don't want to be vulnerable in front of our comrades. And so we just go MIA. The army sustained heavy casualties. That's a, a sample sentence. And then Part B of the definition is a person or thing injured, lost, or destroyed. A person or thing injured, lost, or destroyed. Now, we know that the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Uh, that's in John 10.10, 10, and the remainder of that verse says, but Jesus came life uh, that and gives us life abundantly. So just know that making you a casualty based on the mere 
definition of it is the intent of the enemy anytime there is warfare. But what stood out to me the most is the second definition um, where the word victim is actually highlighted. And so if we break down the word victim and we use that definition, um, a victim is one that is acted on and usually adversely affected by a force or agent, such as one that is injured or destroyed or sacrificed under any of various conditions. Another part of that definition, one that is subjected to oppression, hardship, or mistreatment. And the last part, one that is tricked or duped. So not only is the enemy interested in making you a casualty, but to take it a step further, he wants to victimize you. I know that many of us have experienced real life in like traumas and situations where we came out feeling victimized. That is the intent of the enemy. Kill, still destroy. Oppression stood out to me though in that definition as well, because spiritual warfare itself we know is an act of oppression. The enemy wants us victimized. He wants us to be oppressed to keep us from identifying with the well-known fact that we are victorious in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that in 1 Corinthians 15 and 57. I apologize if I didn't tell you guys, get your, get your journals ready so you can take your notes because we got plenty of scripture to unpack this topic with. But 1 Corinthians 15 and 57 reads, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We already have victory, but the intent of the enemy is to make sure that we forget or that we change our confession about being victorious in our Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to subdue that. He doesn't want you to know that you're truly victorious. He certainly doesn't want you to walk in victory. So that is the challenge that I pose to everyone today. Look at that hard thing that you have going on in your, your life right now and tell it that you are still victorious through your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we know that we can stand confident on the word, that the word of God does not return unto him void, and that he is always glorified in our circumstances. Amen. So we looked at the meaning or definition of casualty. We also broke down the uh, meaning of the word victim. Next, we're going to get into spiritual warfare. And this is a crash course. This is not extensive on spiritual warfare itself because we're gonna specifically talk about practical things that we can do to not be spiritually ambushed and become casualties of war. But for those who may be unfamiliar or don't quite understand what spiritual warfare is, this will be beneficial to you. So it is an act of oppression in the spiritual realm that seeks to keep believers through hardships and um, mistreatment resulting in death, wounds, injury, sickness, internment, or capture, or through being missing in action. I think some of my grammar is off there, but hopefully everyone gets the picture to further um, categorize or characterize spiritual warfare, we have two scriptures that we can look at in particular, and there are many. These are just two, but there are many scriptures on uh, spiritual We know that in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, we are told we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's one scripture. The second one is 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not 
carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearers, readers, and doers of his word. So spiritual warfare, we now have an understanding of what it is and the intent of the enemy is to, number one, deter you from even engaging, deter you from being confrontational, uh, keep you victimized, keep you injured, keep you wounded, keep you oppressed, keep you offended. All the things that would prohibit you from joining forces with your brothers and sisters and being an effective member of the one body we are a part of, and that is uh, the body of Christ himself. So I'll go ahead and start unpacking the tips now. Seven tips to avoid spiritual warfare. So as I was preparing for this message, I came across a post um, by a colonel in the United States Army. And as I was looking at his tips on um, avoiding ambush in war, I said, well, this is very similar to what we should be doing in the body of Christ. And one thing I want to I want to also acknowledge is again, and I, I talked about this at the very top of the teaching is I know we get into the mindset of I can do it, I can take it, I can handle it. I've been saying this for months. I'm going to continue to say it. We need each other. We have to be united in the spirit. Yes. You may send a thousand to flight, but two will send 10,000 to flight. And we know that when one or two are gathered in his name, he is in the midst. He will be present. He will be faithful to um, oversee and execute the performing of his word. We need each other. The enemy does not like unity. He knows how strong the kingdom of God is and the army of the Lord is when we are all working on one accord together. So um, we need each other. If that's uh, an issue for you, we definitely want to pray for you. If you have been injured by anyone in the church, if you are dealing with offense, if you just don't trust people in the church, if you feel like you don't have anyone you are truly doing life with, we definitely um, want to be in agreement that there is a people, there is a family that the Lord sets the solitary in for you and that you will find them, they will find you and you will know and that your experience in the future will not be like what you encountered in the past in the name of Jesus. Okay, so part one, I'm sorry, or point one, tip one. Seven tips to avoid spiritual ambush. The first tip is to consult the commander in chief. Who's our commander in chief? Anyone want to tell me who our commander in chief is in the chat? Who is our commander in chief? Jesus. Yes, Jesus is our commander in chief. Absolutely. We want to make sure that we are consulting uh, Holy Spirit about our our blind spots really and about what strategy we should be implementing and executing before we engage. Um, oftentimes we tend to think that we have it all figured out. We have it all together. And so we miss the opportunity to really invite Christ into the conversation, to invite Holy Spirit into our plan making to make sure that um, we understand the steps that we are supposed to take in engagement, that we're operating according to his will because his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts. And if he knows all, sees all, and is able to exist outside of time, right, the time that he created and know exactly what's coming to us, we have to consult him. That means we have to have a prayer life. We have to be willing to be vulnerable before him and communicate with him. Jeremiah 33 and 3 says, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. 
but what if the great and mighty thing he wants to show you is about yourself? What if it's about us? Because when was the last time we honestly assessed our own weaknesses or our prior um, failings, those moments when we showed up or we didn't show up or those moments where we fell, we fell short in what it was he wanted us to do. Do we know um, what our personal kill zones are? What's the kryptonite for us that would keep us from executing the plan that God gives us? What's our comfort? What things do we run to instead of engaging with him? Do we go back to um, flirtatious relationships? I know that when people have idle time, especially singles, they start texting the person that they know is absolutely no good with them, for them to fill the time. They want to fill the void instead of doing the hard work sometimes which is confronting what we're facing and what the Lord is calling to our attention. Is it an addiction? Is it pornography? Is it drugs? Is it alcohol? Is it pride? Is it ego? Is it co like coveting? Is it jealousy? Is it anger? Is it rage? What's the posture of our hearts? What are our kill zones? Because if we don't understand what our kill zones are, what our triggers are, you better believe that's the first thing that the enemy is going to challenge you with. So we really have to dissect our own lives and determine what's the danger zone for us. What's that toxic behavior, that toxic place that keeps us complacent and not inviting our commander in chief into the conversation and we should recognize that in the right circumstances we will fail because we can do nothing in and of our own accord we can do all things through christ who strengthens us and we have to remember that we we have to govern ourselves according accordingly so we have to consult our commander in chief and let him establish what the strategy, what the battle plan is so that we are victorious. All right, number two, which is already up there. You got to put on your armor. Don't try to put on your pastor's armor. Don't try to put on the prophet's armor. Don't try to put on the apostle's armor. Put on your armor. Maybe you're a runner. Maybe you bring water. Maybe you, you work in the infirmary, infirmary and you heal the sick. Maybe you minister to those who are coming off of the battlefield and are being called back out. What is your part? And your armor may look different from the next person's, but at the end of the day, it fits you. It fits you. It is tailor-made for you. So when we say put on your armor and this is familiar, we are specifically referencing Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 18. Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 18 that says finally be strong in the lord and in his mighty power put on the full armor of god so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the authorities against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day, I lost my part. Okay, so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm, then I'm going to go into the rest of it and, and we'll look at the specific armor. But going back to our definition and just recalling what a word casualty or the word casualty means part of that is not necessarily being injured or 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 being destroyed sometimes it's just going missing in action how many of you know that if you are missing in action you can't stand firm Th those are not the same if you're MIA what are you standing for where are you at where are you standing at not on the front line with your brothers and sisters, not with Christ, you, you retreated, 
you went somewhere else. So we have to build up our stamina to stand firm and resist the urge to just disappear every time we're confronted with something. We have to learn how to press and move forward. We have to have the stamina for it. And we know that we live in a microwave society. Everyone wants it quick, fast, and in a hurry. And I mean, the scripture says, yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, not yea, though I sprint, yea, though I run away from, run through it, skip through it. No, walk through it. Walk through it. You, he may give you the opportunity to, to pull off a power walk, but rushing the process does not prepare you for battle. You're going to miss a whole um, a whole part of the process in terms of what he wants to lay out specifically for you to walk through the valley of shadow and death. So stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Usually when we go MIA, and I don't know why I keep harping on this. Usually when we go MIA, it's not so that we can run in hiding and pray. It's so that we can legitimately check out of the battle. We want no parts of it. We don't want it to touch our lives. We don't want to have to deal with it in our families. We don't want to have to constantly deal with it in the workplace. We definitely don't want it in public. We don't want to deal with it in church. But we have to stand firm together and pray for one another. Even if the prayer is crazy, if it's crazy, do it anyway. Pray it anyway. Release it anyway. There are going to be times where faith calls you to do something crazy. We saw this in the teaching of the alabaster box. The Mary had a very expensive box of oil. And in the midst of all the people during a, a social occasion, she walks in, she breaks that vial, and she anoints the, her Lord. She anoints her teacher. She anoints her commander in chief. Even if it's crazy, we have to do it. That's a part of the strategy. It's a part of how we are reinforced in battle. So if the Lord is telling you to do something that is crazy, you're like, Lord, that is crazy crazy. I don't want to do that. I pray that you have courage to do it still, to do it anyway, that the perfect love of God casts out all fear so that you and those you intercede for, those you co-labor with, those you are in battle with and for, that you do it anyway, that you're victorious. All right, moving on to point three, read the Bible. We have to read the Bible. Hebrews 4 and 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You cannot effectively use a weapon you don't train with. When issues arise, when things arise, when you have to stare that serpent in the face, when you have to stare that lion in the face, my Revolution Church family, you know what I'm, I'm referring to on um, the last Bible study teaching and the last Sunday message, Apostle Daniel talked about what to do when you're confronted with a lion. What's your playbook? Where do you get your strategy? What's the discerner of things for you? Is it 
calling everybody and talking to everybody about it and getting them to stroke your ego so that you feel comfortable with whatever next step you you take? Are you looking for justification to do the opposite of what the word of God would instruct you to do? Because that scripture makes it clear that what the Lord says and what he does on our behalf, our identity in him, us identifying with the word and that it applies to our lives, that it is sharper than a double-edged sword, that it discerns even our own hearts. So it's another way of communicating and consulting with the commander in chief, but we have to effectively use our weapon or we are just surgeons with chainsaws going all over the place and praying amiss, praying amiss. That means not praying according to the will of God. You're targeted over here and he wants you over here. Maybe you're a sharpshooter, but you're trying to use a sword, but you've never trained with one ever. Maybe you just throw grenades, but you want a sword. You've never trained with a sword or maybe it is a sword. Now you want a gun, but you don't know how to use a gun. So learn your playbook. Get familiar with your word. And another thing is there are people who are not Christians who are much more well-versed in the playbook. They're much more well-versed in scriptures and in the Bible than the, the saints are. And we have to study to show ourselves approved. There is no reason why someone who is not of the faith should understand and know the word of God better than we do. That is how they use it to deceive people. So they get to know it, they understand it, and then they use it as a weapon to deceive people into joining other faiths or becoming other lifestyles. And who knows, we're fighting for souls. Whether it's our own, whether it's our family, whether it's our church, our friends, our community, our nation, we are fighting for souls. They use the weapon that God gave us and learn how to train with it more effectively than we do. I saw this post on social media where um, I don't think the people knew it was being filmed necessarily. I couldn't tell, but it was interesting to watch this gentleman approached people in Walmart and he said I will give you $20 if you can quote a scripture from the Bible any scripture I'll give you $20 if you can quote a scripture from the Bible no one got the $20 that day out of the people that he asked there was not a for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son there was no Jesus wept there um, was no you know a perfect love cast out all fear. There was nothing. No one gave a scripture that day. So even if you start out with one a day, one scripture a day, memorizing one verse a week, you know, there was no Satan is the father of all lies. Um, there was no let God be true and every man a liar. There was nothing. And it was sad, y'all. It was sad. We have to start engaging with the word. And before we close out, we are going to talk about prioritizing our time around um, making sure that we are effective in our prayer lives and that we are giving God our time and in our word. So moving on to part four, remember seven steps to um, avoiding spiritual ambush, stay developed and well-trained. The most seasoned of soldiers, if they go home and they no longer attend basic training, they lose their physique, they lose their stamina. Take your discipleship seriously. Yes, we should be discipling to others, but take your own discipleship seriously. Um, our relationship with Holy Spirit is the most important relationship we will ever have in our lives. And our relationship with Him impacts everything else that we have going on. It impacts other relationships. So our calling first is to be followers of Christ and to work out our own salvation with him, but also allow him to develop our character. 
allow him to develop our stamina, our maturity. It is an ongoing thing. We have to stay well-trained and well-developed. Now, things go, they grow quickly in our society. There's always something new going on, something we have to be aware of. Stay engaged in your training, whether it is attending a Bible study, um, whether it is joining a prayer group. Determine what is necessary for you to stay well-trained and don't get into the habit of giving God your last. Give him your first, your first fruit of your day, the first fruit of your lips. That also is a part of training because it builds up discipline. We can play computer games. We can read. We want to go work out at the gym. But where's our time with God? Where's our consulting with him? Where is him being first? And it is absolutely imperative that we continue to develop and grow in spiritual maturity. We cannot be on milk 24-7, 365 for the rest of our days. Milk sustains babies. It can sustain some toddlers. But as you become an adult, if all you're drinking is milk, you are malnourished. Malnourishment sends you to the hospital. Malnourishment doesn't keep you physically fit or well-sustained. It keeps you ill. It keeps you in ICUs. It keeps you in the familiar and it stunts your growth. And we don't want that. We want to start killing that cycle right now, not tomorrow, right now, because we cannot be so arrogant as to think that God even owes us a tomorrow. He doesn't. So the saying is very true. Don't put off tomorrow what you can do today. You have breath in your bodies on today. You have time on today. Start making the change on today. Amen. Moving on to the next point. Um, again, riding solo in this, in this walk, in this journey. Get you some ranger buddies. Again, some of these pointers are coming from um, an article I found that was written by a, a colonel in the U.S. Army about how to avoid ambush. So, number one, consult the commander in chief. Number two, put on your armor. Number three, study the strategy or playbook, which is our Bible. Number four is to stay fit, keep training, and uh, get you some ranger buddies, ranger buddies, no trying to ride this out solo all the time. There are times when the Lord will call us into um, a season of isolation where he kind of pulls us away to get our attention and get some more intimate time with us and reveal things to us. But the Lord honors unity in the body. And if you're always going solo, you're leaving a gap in the post, you're leaving a gap in the wall. You're, you got a gap in, in the strategy, in the formation. There's a gap. So one is good, but having another one is much better. And Jesus never sent the disciples alone. They always went out in pairs. So we have to get out of this, I don't need anyone. Yes, you do. We all need somebody. And all I need is Jesus. Yes, most important relationship. But he sent his people to be his hands and feet in the earth. He's going to send people to you to help you. Don't be so offended or so prideful that you would turn it away. That is not the That's not his heart. He didn't create you to be an island. He created you for community, for unity. Unity with him and unity amongst his people. Ephesians 4, 9 through 12 says two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. So we know that the third there is Holy Spirit, but you got to have one more. 
for that formation to work, for that to be applied. You got to have one more. And it's instructed two or better than one. How do you keep yourself warm if you're out there isolated without any of your ranger buddies? How are you being held accountable to what God is telling you to do if there is no one else around you? I know we get caught up in only God can judge me. Not so. We know that the scripture says that we too, as believers, we will judge. We shall even judge angel, angels. And then another scripture says to, tr um, to try the spirit by the spirit. That word try in its original meaning means to judge. So we will hold each other accountable. And there's a difference between judgment and condemning. There is no condemnation in the body of Christ, but we should absolutely hold one another accountable. If you've struggled with building relationships with your brothers and sisters before, but now the Lord has set you in a new environment and with a new family, how do you know how to labor with your brothers and sisters if you never really build relationship with them? Where does your encouragement come from? How do you guys stand in the gap for one another? If if you've decided, I'm just going to be a lone ranger, I'm just going to do it all myself because it's easier that way because I won't be as easily heard. I won't be offended. There has to be accountability in the body of Christ. Spiritual warfare is a team sport. It's not, it's not lone ranger. It's me, you, and the Holy Spirit, him being the most important one. And us putting what he says to practice. The word works when we work it. Prayer works when we work it. Our faith works when we work it. If we're always running away and we are always MIA and we are always in the ICU, when are we showing up? When are we present for the battle? So I just declare on today that we are not walking away from our posts, that our posts are manned, that we are watchmen on the wall, that we are looking at what is occurring in the city and in the field, and that we have ears to hear clearly. I almost started praying, but I got two more points to go. So moving on to point six or tip six, seek and learn from others. Get counsel from your leaders. Get counsel from those who um, have been assigned to give you guidance on this walk. Um, this tip specifically says to listen to the scouts. They've already gone before you. They've been able to scope out things that you may come across. And they have knowledge and wisdom to help you not stumble in the event that, you know, there is a shortcoming or with a myriad of issues that you could possibly face in the midst of warfare, it is never too late for us to get sound counsel and godly advice from those that the Lord has placed in our lives. Um, James 1 and 5 says, James chapter 1 verse 5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. So he will give you wisdom. And then Proverbs 19 and 20 says, listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. So you'll obtain knowledge, you will obtain information that you may not have to apply immediately, but you may need it in another season. You may need it the next time you're on the battleground. You may need it today, tomorrow, five years from now, but there's going to be something about what that person shares that the Holy Spirit brings into remembrance and you'll be able to apply it for the situation that you are in. I also know that there is this mindset, I wanna address it quickly, that we don't want other people in our business. Listen, I want my leaders in my business. I want my brothers and sisters in my business because they hold me accountable. My brothers and sisters don't gossip about me. My leaders don't gossip about me. And I know that that has been perpetually happening in the church. And that has to, to stop the gossip, the slandering, the using sensitive information against people and using it as a weapon 
because you want control over how they behave and how how they respond to certain things. You want them to walk a certain way, but everyone's walk is different. Introduce them to Christ. Let people counsel you. Proverbs 20 and 5, counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Amen. Thank you for sharing that, brother. I see you out there. I need people in my business. Absolutely, sister. I need people in my business. I need y'all to hold me accountable. And when we hold one another accountable, once something is exposed and revealed, we can deal with it at the root of the issue. It is no longer superficial. So we have to get out of that mindset that everybody wants to be in our business. The thing about Holy Spirit is he will give you so much wisdom. He will cause you to be able to discern who you can share certain types of information with. And boom, now the problem is solved. You know who you can and cannot share certain parts of your testimony with. Issue resolved. A lot of this stuff we're trying to do and figure out by ourselves, Holy Spirit will take care of if you let him, if you trust him. Trust him at his word. Trust his faithfulness more than you trust the fact that you know that they may go gossip about you. More than you trust your insecurities. More than you trust your fears. Trust him more because he is faithful. He has never lost a battle. He has never lost a war. And we know it's already won. We know that we are already champions. We already know how this ends. Operate with that in mind. That even if someone knew the meanest, darkest, dirty, dirtiest thing about you, that his grace is sufficient for you. That they're not putting together some type of plot ploy or scheme against you that he won't cause to fail, especially when the posture of your heart was in the right place. Okay. Last tip. Last tip number seven is to prior prioritize our time. I mentioned this briefly earlier. Listen, we are parents, we are um, we are employees. Most of us, you know, have businesses to run or we have to clock in for someone else. There's always something that needs to be done. We are caretakers of ailing parents or parents whose health is failing. Um, we are trying to love on and spend time with our family, but um, there will never be enough time in the day for us to do everything on a to-do list. I don't know about you guys, but my personal testimony is my to-do list have to-do list. There's always something for me to be doing. And yet daily, if I don't talk to God, I feel like nothing I did on that list mattered because in actuality, it doesn't. I didn't invite him. I didn't invite him to the vision part, vision board party. I didn't invite him to the, the planning session. But the way we spend our time, which is one of the most valuable resources that we have, that money can't even buy money, there's not enough money to buy time. Time is one of the most valuable resources we have, but how we spend it is an indication of our priorities and that we know, and we know that in order to live a more balanced, and it is never fully balanced, trust me, you're going to get 40% some days in one area, 20 over here and another 30 over here, and then 10% will be left doing absolutely nothing maybe. But how we spend our time is an indication of our priorities, just like how we spend our money is an an indication of what really has our attention and our hearts. We want to spend time and pour into our, our, our children. We have ministries, but more importantly, we have to consult our commander in chief, which goes back to number one. We have to spend time getting to know him, getting to understand his nature, getting to understand his, his plans for our life. Will, will he have us walk? How will he have us execute? What's the formation once we head into battle? What are we doing? How are we going to communicate? You know, what does my brother or sister need to the left or right of me? How do we co-labor? And you can't co-labor 
with the commander in chief if you don't know him, if you're not spending time with him. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17 says our spiritual enemy is, I'm sorry, that is not, I don't think that's the scripture. That is not the scripture. Hold on one second. Let me get Ephesians 5 through 17. I apologize. I had all my stuff ready to go because I did not want to overstay my welcome with y'all. So let me get it pulled up here. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. This is the NIV version. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. We know that we can we can make a plan, but it is the Lord who establishes our path. He establishes what we do, how we conduct ourselves, what will be accomplished. And we have to prioritize him in our planning, in our next steps. And let's get out of crisis mode and running to him when everything is already blown to smithereens. We want to approach him well before that. We want to be familiar enough that we know him well enough that even if the battle may come and it surely come, even if the persecution may come and it will surely come, even if we have to get strikes on our back too, even if we have to drink from the cup, that he is faithful. And you don't get to experience that side of him always running away, always being a long ranger and getting injured. Now you got to retreat into the infirmary because you got to heal now. You understand limited aspects of his nature. And I don't know about anyone else, but there's still some parts of his nature I have yet to know and understand. And I'm praying that he comes, he brings me into the knowledge of him. I know him as a good father. I know him as Jehovah Jireh. I know him as Jehovah Nisi. I know him as Jehovah Shalom. I know him as El Shaddai. I know him as uh, El Gabor. I know him as those things. And then there are so many other parts of him that I may not know because his nature is so multifaceted. Let him make it real for you that this is just not a concept. These seven tips to avoid spiritual ambush. This is not just another concept, something that you think is going to be trendy that you can hold on to, but that we know and understand that warfare, spiritual warfare, spiritual ambush is a real thing. And there are practical steps that we can take to make sure that we are prepared for engagement. Our enemy is skilled. He is cunning. He is deceptive. That's what he does. But if we pay close enough attention to our heavenly commander in chief, we can avoid our pitfalls. We can avoid kill zones. We can avoid danger zones. We get the download of revelation for strategy. We get to stay well-developed and build up our stamina and our physique, our spiritual physique. We're not malnourished on the journey. We get to help and assist our brothers and sisters. It's a privilege to be able to co-labor with Christ for our brothers and sisters in the faith. We get to be a functioning member of the body. A functioning member of the body. There's sound wisdom, sound accountability around us. We're seeking to understand more of him and making him the very first person in our lives, prioritizing our time with him. So in closing, I pray that this lesson, this Bible study ministered to your spirit. It ministered to mine. There were some things I had not considered a more, you could say, practical way in terms of strategy during spiritual warfare. But the truth is the enemy, the camps of darkness, the kingdom of darkness, they start pl planning well in advance before October even comes, before it is like peak season for the enemy. They're already planning. They're more disciplined than, than the saints are. They're more disciplined than the believers are. They know the word better than the believers. 
they're already plotting and planning. So doing it in the future is not when we start preparing. We prepare all throughout the year. We prepare in our day-to-day -day lives so that as the warfare increases, as it intensifies, it doesn't swallow us whole. It doesn't kill us. It doesn't kill our spirit, man. It doesn't kill our faith. It doesn't kill our, our beliefs. We're able to actually stand firm in the midst of confrontation and rebuke, declare, decree, denounce, renounce, and move forward. He said, you will declare a thing and it will be established. Not declaring much if you're running or if you're sick or if you're MIA. Unless, I mean, you're declaring healing over yourself, not to minimize that. But there is a time for us to rest and then there is a time for us to gauge and co-labor and be, be confrontational, biblical confrontation. It's a, it's a thing. So I pray that this uh, Bible study minister to you. For those, again, who may come back and watch the replay and may not be familiar with our community here at Fade to Bold, you can find more information at fadetobold.com. You can submit your prayer requests. You can submit testimonies. You can go back and check out um, other um, teachings that may be out there. Thank you for tuning in to this Bold Bible Study. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and connect with our community on Facebook or Instagram at Fate Bold.